Nels, it feels like you on the team did the most sort of digging about what the real job is like, what is in the actual space, and then checked us against reality when we kind of went off the reservation. I, I mean, I, in general, I really like doing research. I've kind of that's sort of a thing I've enjoyed on all the projects I've worked on. Um, so for this, a, a bunch of folks on the team read this great book called Fire Season by Philip Connors, which is kind of like a memoir ish thing from this dude who still is an active fire lookout even today. Um, but I also just <laughs> I called up the the Ministry of Forests and Natural Resources here in British Columbia and got redirected to like three increasingly small Ministry of Forest offices until someone just gave me literally the phone number of this cool old lady who had once been a for, uh, fire lookout. So I just kind of chatted with her for like an hour and a half just about what doing the job was like. The reason why <laughs> the game is not a simulation of being a fire lookout is because what everyone talks about is that the number one challenge with the job is that it is incredibly, impossibly boring. Because you, you can't, like, read a book. You can't, like, be doing other things, right? Like Not really. Yeah. At, at the end of day three, where Delilah mentions, it's like, Kendra's like, well, what do I do for the rest of the summer? She's like, you sit in that chair and you look out the window. That is actually what fire lookouts really do. So all the folks I talked to said, like, Figuring out ways to combat boredom is the number one thing. Uh, the lady I talked to, she said she did a whole lot of needlepoint and cross-stitch because you can do that without looking at your hands very much. <laughs> Obviously, like, lookouts are also responsible for doing, you know, maintenance on their towers. But again, it's like not maintenance because some crazy Yahoo smashed up your tower. It's maintenance like, oh, the paint is kind of flaking off. Better paint it. Or these trees have grown too tall, so I need to chop them down. Not I'm chopping down trees to form a weird log bridge. The main takeaway from whenever we would talk to someone who had done this job is why would you make a game about that? That is the most boring time <laughs> of my entire life. So uh, oh, hopefully yeah. uh, we showed them how. It feels like people who, who do this job like fall into two camps, right? They're the people who think they can do it and can't hack it and bail after like a month or two. You know, people like Jack Kerouac who tried to do this and wrote about it in Desolation Angels. And then he <laughs> he went crazy from a lack of cigarettes and then left. Or the people who kind of enjoy the solitude and then figure out ways to, to deal with it. But, you know, we, we do have like a lot of the window dressing for the stuff people use. Like <laughs> other folks I talk to, it's like, what do you do? Well, we read a lot of books and we like trade the books between the different lookouts through Rangers and stuff like that. So of course, Firewatch has a crap ton of weird books in it. <laughs> stuff like that. Hey, it's Jake again. And it's Jane again. All right. Let's talk about Two Forks Lookout. I mean, we could just talk about lookout towers in general yes. in video games. Mm -hmm. um, well, you built it. You want to talk about it? <laughs> yes. So lookout towers have actual standard sizes, actually. Um, I think most of these were either uh, 14 feet by 14 feet in the inside or something like 7. Like, there's actually like a tiny. standard. Wow. Yeah. yeah, the cabins have standard sizes. And the ones that you have a bed and stay in are the 14 uh, feet ones. And um, we realized through uh, a few experiments that if you make a space that's actually 14 feet in the game, it would be too tiny. Yeah, I remember you found a tower in th a lookout tower enthusiast website that had posted the actual blueprints that mm -hmm. the state parks and forest yes. service used. So we're like, we're doing yeah. this. Yeah. We're building it to scale. Yes. <gasps> it's and tiny. You can't yeah, move around. <laughs> it's tiny, and then basically the camera just has no room to maneuver at all. Yeah, and you just feel like a fat guy, like you can't f fit yeah. between uh, your desk and the firefighter. Yeah, and it feels like you're just in a shoebox. Mm -hmm. So we did a few experiments. I was like, okay, how about it's twice as big? And when it's twice as big, and it's just like, like no. Like palatial yeah, fire lookout cribs. And then like on the outside, the silhouette of the of the space also looks wrong. So we ended up with, uh, I think, something like one and a half size bigger than real life. And it feels like a real fire lookout. Over the course of the game, as things change, there's a bunch of variants of the tower too, right? I mean, simple stuff like the broken window, but then also oh, we yes. move furniture around. Mm -hmm. Henry gets moved in over the time. Yeah, there are different time. states of the interior, and we achieve that by actually swapping out the whole interior set. 
Like seven or eight times, I think. A lot of times. As the game moves on, then more and more of his stuff starts showing up, and then Henry is a slob, and so his like undies are everywhere, and all. Window stuff. gets broken. <laughs> window gets fixed. Exactly. Conspiracy board goes uh-huh. up. Yeah. yeah, and dirty socks get all over the place. Just tell the story of some slobby dude up here. <laughs> exactly. Hi there, it's Jake and Chris again. Hey, so here we are in the cash box clearing. Or at least I guess that's what we call it. There's a lot of cash boxes in Firewatch, but this was the first one that we placed into the game. For a long time, this was the cash box. It was the cash box, um, even though we knew we wanted to have more. Um, This area was actually one of the first areas that we built out to any degree that looks like a piece of the world. Um, It was a really good proving ground for us. Like When me and Nels Anderson were grayboxing the world at the very beginning, we tried a million different things. uh, Like maybe this was on the edge of a cliff, or maybe it was a secret that you had to find. And uh, I think it was Sean who suggested that he really wanted it to feel like a warm... Uh, sort of enclosed space like you've stumbled onto a little glen and you want to stay there for a while, which I think makes sense because we wanted people to actually stop and poke around and have it not feel like the woods. This was a, this was an area with a lot of firsts. Um, I remember this really ended up looking a lot like Ollie's concept art in mm-hmm. a way I think that felt like an accomplishment when it all got built out. It was also the first audio I implemented in the entire game, I believe. The foley on the locks and the lid? Right, exactly. Oh, this was, man, this was also, the cash box was also our proving ground for detailed object interaction with Henry Uh animating the lock. And also, there is a... um, an exit out if you back up and turn left that was the first time I pr- prototyped one-way drops and also any like sort of secret paths because the way that you cross the canyon also showed up here. And I didn't tell anyone on the team about it for like months. And people only noticed it once they started playing the back half of the game. And right. it was very fulfilling for me. Nice. Cash box. Cash box. Land of firsts and secrets. That's the state flag of cash boxes. <laughs> The radio went on a real evolutionary journey. I don't know if you remember back at the very beginning when we all got together to make the game. We got together in December, like the first week of December, and we said, well, we're definitely going to take Christmas break, but what can we make in two weeks with this crew in Unity, an engine we've never used before? And we started just starting with the radio mechanic. And I quickly wrote like a mystery about an FBI agent looking for a kidnapper in the woods. And then you had like a dispatcher who was like, go to this place and look for this. Oh, I think he left. And I think that's when we sort of proved out that looking at things and pointing at them the way you would like in a shooter, but then getting options to talk about them was the thing we were going to do. That's kind of where the radio mechanic is so different from most conversation systems and games, right? Because most game conversation systems like, oh, you're standing next to this guy, so you can talk to him now and you will be able to talk about things that have recently happened to you. But since it's a radio, it's like you could be anywhere any time talking about whatever you're looking at. So even as we started to like do that initial prototyping, we sort of realized like, oh, that's very interesting. Also, this is really complicated and very different from how most games do dialogue. Yeah, when you're standing in front of a character, you just sort of have the like very like binary rule of I am standing in front of a character in an adventure game, I can talk. I walk away, I can't. When you change that up and you can talk about things wherever because the proximity to that character is no longer relevant, you start to find really weird cases. Like, what do you do when you want to talk about an idea or a sound you just heard? A smell. So then we had to sort of like bring the radio mechanic into the realm of like the intangible. And I don't think that really came on until much later. Yeah. We got like, I think during that prototype, we got the very initial vestiges of it, but in that in that initial prototype, it was so simple where it's like, oh, if you're looking at this weird stone head, you can like push the one button to play this crappy audio top of Oh hi Mark from Tommy Wiseau's The Room, or you can push two to say, Oh hi Denny instead. That was the darkest time of development <laughs> but it, for me. It was the most wonderful time. Because that 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 movie gives me real physical illness. <laughs> when we had mapped the radio mechanic to two lines from the room, I was I was in I was in a bad way about about that. I I, I enjoyed it greatly. I know you did. Uh, I know you did. Though. Yes, Jake. Oh, hey, Sean. You did a neat thing here in the game that I like a lot, which oh. is when you make a dialogue choice with Delilah about what this uh, this dangerous hill should be called. It shows up on your map, and I like that a lot. Yeah, when we were putting the map system together, well, actually, the map 
weirdly was one of the latest things, one of the final things to come into the game as a fully fleshed out piece. Uh, but an upside of that is we built the map using a lot of tools we already had. For instance, the system that checks which things you have and haven't talked about, which things you haven't 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 found in the game. Use the same variable list as our speech system. So when I was putting this together, I realized, oh, not only can I put a, a mark down on the map when Henry finds it or talks about it, but I can totally look at the same tools we use for dialogue and figure out what the player said and put it on the map. And the end result felt really natural. I actually wish we'd gone a little deeper on it in the game, but I'm really happy with what's in there right now. Also, please name this uh, shitty boss is going to get me killed because that's objectively the best name for the hill. Is that your handwriting? Yeah, you got to write all, you got to cram that in there, but it's still readable. Hi, this is Ollie Moss, and I was the art director on Firewatch. I'm Jane. Hi, Jane. Let's talk about this teen zone. Oh, let's talk about zone. this. Let's talk about the teen zone. <laughs> um, so the teen zone is one of the first areas that we uh, that w- we used as a sort of art test to see how mm-hmm. we would go about building the rest of the game. We knew from the pretty early on that like. Uh, on day one, you will start from the tower, and you will have to head down to the lake. And somewhere in between, you mm. will see some teens, and they're partying. And so we <laughs> call this the teen zone because this is where all the teen stuff is. Yeah, and it was, and we, it was important to us that the reveal that it was a group of teens was communicated through the level design. So the idea was that you just kind of like walk through some trees and burst mm-hmm. out into the scene where a campfire was still burning. And uh, you had a pretty strong idea of what it, what you wanted to look like. Yeah, I just wanted to put some big angular rocks in there, <laughs> which is basically the, the like my modus operandi for the entire game. Um, but we wanted to have a big angular sort of rock which came yeah. on as Pride Rock because it looked so much like the rock from The Lion I know, King. we did name that Pride Rock, didn't mm. we? That rock does serve as a very uh, strong landmark pretty mm. early in the game, and it kind of does point the, the player in the right direction. Exactly. Yeah. Um, should we talk a little bit about our process for sure. designing these areas? Um, so in the beginning, when uh, we just have um, like no concept art, we will just mock it out with just gray... Literally just gray boxes and a gray terrain. And then uh, we will take screenshots and give it to Ollie to be like, please pretty this up, Ollie. Oh, well, first of all, I'll do, a, I'll do a terrible, terrible garbage sketch and pitch it to the team. And if people like the gist of it, then we'll go away and do a bit more of a, deta- more of a detailed mm-hmm. drawing. And then you would go... Yeah, we'll add in some more shapes. Mm-hmm. And then we just keep going back and forth with paint overs from mm-hmm. Ollie. And then it's just a sort of uh, tennis, really, just back yeah. and forth between between the two of us until we're until everyone's happy with what we have. Yeah. My name is Patrick Ewing. I worked on uh, tools and gameplay programming. The teens, Patrick. Let's open some old wounds here. This is a real. This is like going back to like an old battleground and being like in, on these exactly. hollowed grounds. Yeah. Bad I died things on this hill. happened. I died on this hill. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's one of the most complex uh, interactions in the game, if not the most, right? Yeah. And it, uh, it was in the game from the very first vertical slice we did. And then I think we kind of added to it as we played through it and saw like, Oh, we should be able to throw the boombox in the lake, obviously, right? Okay, the the teens need to react to the boombox being in the lake. Oh, but then they should also react to you putting it down. What you should do if you're making a video game is build relatively ironclad, predictable AI and systems that react to inputs. But instead, we built a series of relatively flimsy state machines that were like, if this, if this, if this, but not when, and also if. Right. And uh, we're able to create this scene as designed um and patrick was sort of the the shepherd of this scene so whenever anything would break if you were to throw the boom box and the teens were not to respond or you leave with the boom box and they would talk about something else it was patrick's job to ferret into the right state machine and right. figure out what was going on yeah and I'm, I'm happy with how it turned out there are so many different ways that this scene can play out now depending on what you choose to do uh do you throw the fireworks at them do you talk to them and then start messing up their stuff and throwing it in um and it ends up being pretty uh n- like believable they feel like real characters uh it's just such a crazy spaghetti code in the in the back end that I'm always terrified when I see someone play through it, that there's <laughs> some so interaction <laughs> that we didn't think about. That right yeah. now the player is interacting with the teens in a way that is completely not by the book. And I, I mean, luckily we have sweat or, or, or building on your brow. <laughs> yeah. I think it's just a PTSD response at this point. We would see the bug reports if this was actually still breakable. Yeah. Hello, my name is Erin Yvette and I'm the voice of Chelsea. 
Hi, my name is Nikki Rupp, and I'm the voice of Lily. <laughs> and we are the we're the drunk teens in the lake. <laughs> the obnoxious, skinny dipping, drunk, firework blasting teens. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't the first time that you've played a Lily, though. It is not. It's actually <laughs> the third time I've played a Lily. My first Lily was Lily Zanotto in Psychonauts. And then I played the lovable Lily in The Walking Dead from Telltale. <laughs> and now I'm uh, Lily in Campo Santo's Amazing Game Firewatch. <laughs> I'm pretty sure the backstory behind my character's name is that it's Sean Vanneman's girlfriend's name. <laughs> Slightly less backstory for me rad, personally. Though. But she's a cool person in real life, so I... I it's fine. Although That's I wouldn't good. say that this character is based off of her because this character is. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I guess I guess I always pictured her being changing majors constantly in college because she like can't decide what she wants to do. Like she's gone through like psychology and sociology and like and just constantly flunking out of everything. <laughs> Yeah, so she's I just think, switching until something sticks. That's good you had ambition. I don't think my character really... <laughs> I think she just was uh, kind of drunk, cutting class. This isn't the <laughs> first time that they've done something like this. Not at all. I think they were professionals at it. They were good. They were good at getting people to buy them booze, you know? Totally. That kind of a thing. That's good. Stand outside of 7-Eleven. Whenever people ask me, like, oh, who did you play in Firewatch? It's like, oh, remember that time on day one where, like, you saw these silhouettes of, like, gyrating women? I was one of those. I yeah, probably like, called bras. you a fucking asshole. <laughs> that was me. <laughs> That's a dubious honor, but it's still an honor. It, totally, yeah. <laughs> a little, little tiny bit of a really cool game. Thanks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're welcome. Hi, everyone. This is uh, Ben Burbank. I'm a programmer at Campo Santo, uh, predominantly doing graphics work and performance stuff. And I'm here with Jane. Hi, I'm back. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about, in general, how the world sort of streams in. Mm -hmm. This is a big open world game. There are, like, what, tens of thousands of trees somewhere in there? Yeah, and we have how many chunks of the world that we stream in and out? There are a hundred plus. Uh, yeah, I think over 120. One of the big challenges with that was we have to remove parts of it when you're not looking at it because video game consoles and computers don't like to draw things mm -hmm. that aren't uh, Especially seen. not a lot of trees. Yeah, it's a lot <laughs> a lot of work for that little graphics card to do to try and draw all those uh, that big forest. So mm -hmm. Um, the canyon's one of the spots where we have, like, obvious occlusion, where mm -hmm. you can't see most of the world. Um, so we unload, uh, like, the tower hub. The mm -hmm. tower that you see in the canyon is fake. Mm -hmm. um, it's a small fake version. Yeah. Um, which is a common trick. Yeah, so it's like a very low-cost version of what it would actually be there. One of the biggest challenges for Jane and people building the levels was figuring out line of sight. So mm -hmm. how far can you see? Like, if you have a point where you can see entirely across the map, we had to be very careful about what is actually loaded and what's actually drawing. Yeah, so even though the canyon is pretty much a straight corridor, we had to put in some kinks in there. So, you know, um, like right sort of in the middle, there's a little area where you have to go around a rock. This is so that we could uh, make sure you won't be looking at the lake when we um, basically delete it out of the world. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the game also, you know, it's, it's sort of nonlinear. Like there's a linear story going on, but there's the ability for the player to just go backwards. Mm -hmm. So we also had to keep in mind, like, reverse line of sight yeah. and things like that, which is a little different than a traditional action game or something. Yeah, it's kind of like a little puzzle game almost to figure out when we stream in and out things. So uh, hopefully you don't notice any of it, because if you do, that's not that's actually us not doing a great job. You probably will notice it, though, sometimes. I'm sorry <laughs> about that. Hi, I'm Jane. We're back. And I'm Ollie. Let's talk about this cave, Ollie. Oh, let's not. This cave really gave us all quite a bit of headache, actually. Mm. I was actually kind of having a mini panic attack because one of the hardest things to light in games, actually, is um, any area that's sort of half in, half indoor and half outdoor. And mm. this uh, cave is um, a pain in the butt to light. It is. Well, having... Um we thought you'd be an old pro at this, having worked <laughs> on a game called The Cave. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was it, it caused a lot of problems um, in terms of the logic gating of uh, the environment switches because with the, with every yeah. time the time of day changes in the game, it has to it then like sets that time of yeah, day because there's no so, doorway really. So the way the cave is yeah. lit, it actually just changes the time of day in the whole game. So like when you hit a trigger, 
if you could somehow magically transport yourself back outside the cave, you'd see like the yeah. sun spinning through the sky, the, top, yeah. like, the, the sky changing. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was a real, it was really hard to make that process invisible to the player and make it yeah. feel natural. Not to mention that when you're inside the cave, everything also has to look really dark. Mm-hmm. And um, we use a method called image-based lighting throughout the game. And that basically means that um, all the objects, like all the trees and rocks, just look out to the sky to see what their lighting should be. And so in the cave, we actually had to do um, sort of like a, a fake sky for anything inside that is just pure black. So the, the lighting inside would be appropriately dark. But still navigatable to a player without the exactly. flashlight. Exactly, and so, and also to be able to, to um, have a smooth transition when you're going from the, um, you know, brightly lit outside to the really dark inside, and coming back out again, and having the, all the appropriate logic for the time of day, like Ollie said, it was just a real pain in the butt. I love the little details in Firewatch's branching dialogue. Um, there are a lot of very subtle, hard to notice things that Sean put in uh, while writing it that you really couldn't notice without multiple playthroughs, um, but they add up to this feeling that you're talking to real people who, uh, just like real people, kind of echo back things you said earlier, uh, who, uh, you know, continue in jokes that have been established, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the subtlest that I don't think I even noticed till I was rewiring the game midway through is the spooky figure who you meet uh, at the, towards spooky the end of day Spooky yeah. figure! If the teens call you a creep, Henry calls the guy who's flag putting a flashlight in his face a creep. Right. And he goes, there's some guy out here creeping? Or he says something like, he's a creep out here? She's like, yeah. a creep, Henry? He's like, right. yeah, there's a guy who's spooking me out here. I don't, right. I don't like it. And, I mean, I like doing stuff like that. I pay a lot of attention to sort of the sort of infectiousness of language. Yeah. Uh, especially in this office. Someone will start using a turn of phrase that then I'll be at lunch with someone later, I'll be out with Jake or whatever, and then I'll hear the phrase theory crafting th- through them, yeah. you know, where it's like, you know, like if we were, if somebody was saying, oh, there was a total creep outside at the bus stop, then it wouldn't be long, like 18 hours later, it would be totally conceivable to hear Jake be like, oh yeah, this guy, that guy's kind of a creep. I don't know if we should have him by or whatever. Yep. And I'm like, man, okay, like that word is now like, bubbling along the surface of our social networking. Mm-hmm. And I like, people are like that. People are weird, sort of like passive, like non-participatory sponges sometimes. Yeah. And I just like putting that stuff in the writing. And you can do that in games in a way that you can't do that in other media. If you do that in like a book or something, it's so double underlined mm-hmm. that it feels like you're making a big point as an author. But in a game, because it's player-driven and it's passive, it just feels causal and the way the world works. Chris again here. Hey, and Jake, congratulations, player. You have completed the teen loop. Oh, man, that's true. This is the end of what was what was originally called teenloop.unity, a scene file in our game engine Unity, because we thought that that was just going to be the file corresponding to the to first... To this piece of, of game that you've just played. Yeah, this first big objective. Uh, but then we kept building, so all of Firewatch is in fact saved inside of a file called teenloop.unity. So yep, know that for game. the rest of your play experience, <laughs> you are inside of the teen loop. Yeah. This part of the game, you probably are right now, if you're listening to these commentary notes basically in sequence. Um, the music is either about to kick in or has just kicked in. Uh, it's dark. You're finding your tower has been broken into. This, I really strongly remember feeling when this went into the game and had the music, which was actually the first music implemented in the entire mm-hmm. game. Um, all this stuff together felt to me like the first real moment of assertive tension in the game, and it felt really crazy Yeah, because we me. had um, our environment system working for the first time, so the sky turned to nighttime, yep. and uh, our world logic allowed the tower to switch into its broken-into state just when you were off in the world mm-hmm. for the first time. And then when that music finally came in, we're like, oh wow, okay, this is a world that's alive and can be tense and cinematic. Yep. Uh, and all of it happened without us ever having to cut the camera. I remember being, we were all very proud and stoked mm-hmm. of that. 
for sure. That was like right before we first demoed the game, I think, at the, at the Penny Arcade Expo. Yeah, because the end of day one was the end of the first demo. Yeah. Right before this, there's the moment with the, the creepy guy mm-hmm. in the woods, and that was sort of a moment of tension, but that's also arguably maybe not, because it's immediately deflated by Delilah. Right, but this, this was like, like, holy crap. Okay, we're, I remember feeling kind of nervous about it, because it was like, the game is declaring this is a tense moment, and if it falls flat, we have failed. We can't, like, make a joke to defuse it. Um, and I think it basically worked, and I was a real, real relief. Yeah. Yeah. Ba 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 ba. 